It's a story we are all familiar with. A story of loyalty, betrayal, idealism, and cynicism. The date of the event is forever burned into the collective consciousness. Plays have been written about it, movies and TV shows have reenacted the events, and historians have been fascinated by the factors that led to the historic event that took place on the Ides of March in 44 BCE. Today's story is about the assassination of Julius Caesar and the impact his death would have on the flailing Roman Republic. Sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story while Rome burns. Gaius Julius Caesar was born on July 12th, 100 BCE, into a patrician family of Rome. Throughout his career, Caesar would slowly build up influence and wealth until he was considered one of the most wealthy and influential Romans of his day. Caesar was loved by the people, and his populist policies and proposals made him a darling of the mob in Rome. Coupled with his successful leadership qualities, which led to a fierce loyalty among the legions he commanded, Caesar was the man of the hour in Roman politics. The only group that Caesar did not have 100% on his side were the members of the senatorial faction known as the Optimates, led by Cato of Utica. The Optimates viewed the populist policies of the Caesarians as dangerous to the Republic and to their own power, and thus sought ways to limit Caesar's influence, eventually branding him an enemy of the people and calling for him to stand trial in Rome. This led to one of the most decisive moments in history. Caesar and his legions approached the Rubicon, the border which demarcated the boundaries between his province of Gaul and Italia. Crossing the river without disbanding his legions under his command would be considered an act of war. But disbanding his legions and returning to Rome as a private citizen would lead to Caesar's arrest and trial by the Senate for the activities that had taken place under his reign as consul a few years earlier. Caesar looked out and weighed his options. Caesar knew that by crossing the Rubicon and advancing on Rome, he would be bringing untold suffering upon thousands of his own fellow citizens. He would plunge Rome into a civil war and would put the people through the desperation and destruction that civil wars have always caused. But on the other hand, was Caesar's own personal dignity, honor, and ego. Unfortunately for the Republic, Caesar chose his own ego over the well-being of Rome's citizens. He ordered his troops to cross into Italia, saying, The die has been cast. For Caesar, there was no turning back at this point. The civil war between the Caesarians and the Optimates was a brutal civil war that saw Julius Caesar rise to power by the end. Many of the Optimates were killed in battle or committed suicide, not wanting to live under the tyranny of a dictatorship. But those who survived the war were surprised by Caesar's willingness to grant clemency to his former enemies. Caesar did not see the point in killing those whom he had already defeated, and did not wish to waste lives and resources that could be better put in service of the new order in Rome. Following the war and the subsequent pardoning of his former enemies, Caesar began solidifying his power in Rome and testing the waters for the title and position he truly desired, king. The Romans considered a king to be a tyranny, having overthrown the last kings centuries earlier. Even the name king in Latin, Rex, was considered an insult or curse. Caesar's desire to be king of Rome was made clear to the aristocracy of Rome after three events took place between the end of 45 BCE and Caesar's death in March of 44 BCE. The first of these events occurred sometime in December of 45 BCE or January 44 BCE. Cassius Dio doesn't give us an exact date. 
At this time, Caesar was performing his duties as Pontifex Maximus, High Priest of Rome, at the Temple of Venus Genetrix. A group of senators, probably seeking to garner favor with Caesar, came into the temple to bestow honors upon Caesar. Roman tradition held that Caesar should have stood and greeted the senators, as they were all equals in the eye of the law. But as these senators approached and greeted him, Caesar refused to rise and greet them in return. This refusal to rise placed him at odds with the Senate and gave the impression to the senators that Caesar no longer cared what they thought. After all, Caesar was dictator. His word was law. What would he need the Senate for anyway? The second event took place sometime in mid to late January. The tribunes Gaius Morellus and Lucius Flavus discovered a statue of Caesar with a crown placed upon its head. While the culprit was never caught, suspicions flew about who had really done it, with Caesar casting his suspicions upon the tribunes themselves. A few days later, Caesar was riding through the streets of Rome when the mob began chanting the word Rex at Caesar. Caesar corrected them, saying, I am not Rex, I am Caesar. The tribunes had some of those calling Caesar king arrested. This furthered Caesar's suspicion that the tribunes were in fact trying to turn public opinion against him, and so Caesar ordered Morellus and Flavus arrested. If the tribunes were trying to turn the mob against Caesar, this move played right into that plan. The tribunes were seen as the representatives of the common people, and having them arrested was seen as an assault on the very people of Rome. Public opinion towards Caesar began to sour. The final incident occurred on February 15, 44 BCE, at the festival of the Lupercal. Mark Antony, Caesar's co-consul, attempted three times to place a crown upon Caesar's head. Each time this occurred, there was a small applause, but most of the crowd sat in silence. Each time, Caesar removed the crown and said, I am not a king, I am Caesar. But the senators were not fooled by this display of political theater. They realized that this had been a test run by Caesar to see if the Romans would accept him as their king. It was then decided that something must be done about Caesar. Marcus Brutus and Cassius Longinus conspired together with about 60 other men to assassinate Caesar. The conspirators consisted of both Caesarians and former soldiers that had served under Pompey, people that were pardoned by Caesar after the Civil War. The conspirators argued about whether to kill Mark Antony along with Caesar, but eventually agreed that if they killed Mark Antony, they would look like they were getting revenge for losing the Civil War. They wanted to appear as loyal Romans, saving the Republic from a tyrant. And so, on March 15th, 44 BCE, the senators gathered in the Senate House in the Theater of Pompey and waited for Caesar to arrive. As the minutes and hours ticked by, the conspirators grew nervous. Perhaps Caesar had been tipped off. Unfortunately, Caesar had not known of the conspiracy, but was instead asked to stay home by his wife Calpurnia. Calpurnia had dreamt the night before of Caesar's death and feared it to be a premonition from the gods. Caesar agreed to stay home until a messenger from the senators arrived asking him to come to the theater of Pompey, dismissing Calpurnia's vision as just superstition. Caesar relented and made his way toward the Senate House. Legend holds that a loyal Caesarian tried to warn Caesar of the plot, but couldn't reach him, and so thrust a note of warning into his hand. Caesar had no time to read it and stuffed it into his papers. The legend holds that the note was then found clutched in his dead hands. Regardless of whether that rumor is true, it does not change the fate of the dictator. Caesar arrived at the Senate House and began taking petitions from the senators. A man by the name of Lucius Cimber approached Caesar and begged for his brother to be returned from exile. Caesar refused, which caused Cimber to grab Caesar by the toga and begin to beg. Caesar yelled out, This is violence! This had been the signal the senators were waiting for. Casca was the first to attack Caesar, slashing at his neck with a shallow wound. 
Caesar faced his attacker and questioned what he was doing. Casca called out for help, which caused the rest of the crowd of senators to fall upon Caesar. Caesar tried to get away, but was unable to do so, surrounded by the mass of senators around him. By the time Caesar fell, he had suffered 23 stab wounds, including one that pierced his aorta. Caesar's last words are disputed. Some say that he said nothing at all. Others state that he looked upon Marcus Brutus, a person whom he had loved as a son, and said in Greek, You too, child, before falling dead. As he fell and died, Caesar's last act is said to have been covering his face with his toga, so as not to give his killers the pleasure of watching him die. The conspirators charged out of the Senate House to proclaim Caesar's death to the mob. People of Rome, we are free once more, they shouted. They were met with silence. The death of Caesar had indeed changed the trajectory that Rome was on, but the conspirators that killed Caesar had no idea where that trajectory would eventually lead. While Rome Burns is part of the One Up Podcast Network. Find more of our content, including transcripts, cast info, and more podcasts by going to oneuppodcasts.com. Cover art by Igor Nunes. Find more of his work by going to wecan.artstation.com. And contact him for commissions on Twitter at wecan. That's W-H-Y-C-C-A-N. Background music provided by One Place Here, under a public domain dedication from Creative Commons. Find them on Twitter at One Place Here Music or at freemusicarchive.org slash music slash One Place Here. That's M-O-N-P-L-A-I-S-I-R. Episode 10 will release in one week. Thank you so much for listening. 